Hi to everybody and welcome to today's event where we have the pleasure to present uh, Green Mobility to help us through today's presentation. Group CFO uh, Anna Svail. Presentation today, fresh off the press, your yearly reports, maybe with a special focus, of course, looking back, but also looking ahead, you know, for your guidance. I think that has a little bit of attention because it's coming uh, in the midst of this uh, large, large uh, strategy transition you're in. So that was uh, finally put some numbers on what could that be achieved this year. So I'm sure you will get in on that. As always, ask questions in the box down below. Uh, uh, do it through the presentation, do it in Danish, English, Swedish, German. I will translate to the best of my ability, but we will do the presentation in, in English. But for now, I will hand the call over to you, Anas. Thank you very much, uh, Mikhail, and uh, welcome, everyone. And as, as Michael introduced, yes, um, our annual report, which we released earlier today, uh, and I will um, go through some, some slides and, and cover at least the, the main parts of our business. And of course, as, as Michael also said, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to post them. Um, from our uh, business um, this year, um, as, uh, as the ones of you who are familiar with us, um, this is a familiar map we have. Um, it has changed a little bit uh, in the sense of, of the number of, of dots and the number of cities that we're in. Um, uh, it, to some extent, when we are talking about 22, uh, it's a misrepresentation because we still had a, a few more dots, but uh, but I also come back to, to some of the markets. But what um, we announced early 23 is that we refocused our strategy and as part of that uh, consolidation of our business into our uh, strongest markets. And with that, also the closure of our Swedish and, and German markets. Uh, so that's why they are they are no longer present at, at our map because that is uh, also a representation of, of where we are as of today. Uh, some of the key figures, uh, I'll come back to that and then we can jump uh, into the next slide here. Where some of the, um, the key highlights of the year um, um, uh, I've posted here, I'll come back to, to most of them in, in more detail. Uh, but of course, um, as, as the headline from our report today as well, a continued strong uh, growth in our revenue of 56%, uh, which I think in, in given everything that we've seen in the past year and in, in the world, um, it's something that we can be quite satisfied with. Uh, we would uh, originally have uh, expected a higher revenue, but, um, but of course the, the world turned out a, a, a bit different uh, during 22. Um, it was also a year where we, ex uh, we expanded into some new markets, among those uh, Netherlands, where we acquired Fetch Mobility in, in the start of 22. Uh, we went into Germany, um, and as just mentioned before, we went out again. Um, and that's, uh, that's tied directly to, uh, to our um, uh, refocus of strategy. I'll come back to that uh, in a couple of, slide of slides. <clears throat> We've replaced a, a large part of our fleet during last year and, of course, also increased it uh, to a total of, of approximately 1,600 EVs now across, uh, across the four countries that we operate in today. We've moved into a more premium segment, um, also something I'll touch a little bit uh, upon in a minute, um, and, of course, seen these external factors. All in all, uh, I think with a lot of challenges during the year, but also a year that we can uh, look back at um, and, and also see the basis for our future growth in, in green mobility. A key part is um, also tied to the refocus of our strategy and, and something we also announced in the beginning of January that given these changes, uh, we also expect to have enough cash or liquidity, if you like, um, so where there was previously an expectation of, of raising new equity, uh, that's not going to be the case for, for 23. We can continue to operate the business that, that we're in. Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, touching a little bit on, on, upon these market conditions that became increasingly more um, uh, critical last year. Um, I think we went into the start of the year with, uh, with a lot of excitement coming out of COVID. Everything started to look more and more bright. Uh, the last of our markets where, where we had lockdowns, they, they opened up again. So um, naturally, it was with, with some disbelief that first we saw the delays in, in new cars. Uh, it was obvious that also coming out of COVID that the automotive industry was still 
significantly impacted. And and with the, the war in Ukraine, that actually uh, got worse because um, I think what what most people are not aware of that a lot of uh, automotive parts comes or manufacturers in Ukraine. Uh, all the, the wiring, uh, most of the harnesses uh, that you use in, in uh, cars are actually made in Ukraine. So that gave a, an additional delay. Then, of course, uh, the energy prices um, that, that had a, a, a pan-European effect uh, on, on private consumers, but also businesses, and ultimately also impacted uh, charging for electric cars. Um, interest rates going up, and of course, all of this also impacting consumer behavior. So, so those are, uh, I would think, the main parts that we saw uh, that impacted the business to, to uh, in various degrees uh, last year. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's also when we look at at, at the new year and in twenty three, what are we expecting? And I think the the, the clear message is that. There are uncertainties that no one can predict, um, but we're assuming that that the level we have at the moment uh, is the level that we will see probably throughout the year. There will probably be some uh, some interest changes. Uh, hopefully, we'll see energy going down again. Uh, we've already seen that on, on spot markets, so uh, so I expect that will will drop during the year as well. But no doubt that that we've we've uh, gone through a year of, of a lot of uncertainty, and I think it will. Will definitely continue um, to some extent. Um, <clears throat> going here, yeah, I think just to give you sort of a, a, a view on the, the changes or development we've seen throughout the, the quarters, where, um, as uh, as you probably know as well, we did a adjustment of our guidance um, in in the beginning of beginning of Q4. Uh, which is also um, what you see. You, there is still a growth in, in Q4, but um, but normally we would have seen a larger um, effect on that. And of course, also an increased uh, level of expenses uh, tied very much to interest rates and of course the, the energy cost that uh, directly affects our business as well. But just to give you a, um, a view on, on the development throughout the year. Turning to the next slide, and I think that's uh, that's something that's um, probably of, of high interest to many. Um, as we announced uh, on the 10th of January, a refocusing of our strategy, um, and, and it's very clear, uh, the, the clear focus is to preserve cash. Uh, what we've chosen to do is consolidate our business into our core markets, being Denmark, Finland, Belgium, and, and the Netherlands. Um, and those are the countries or markets of, of ours where we see the highest revenue per car, uh, which also means ultimately the lowest cash burn, assuming that we have more or less the same cost per car uh, in these markets. That um, uh, had the consequence of, of, of us closing Sweden, a market we've been in for, for a couple of years, uh, but also where we saw that, that the continued development would be too slow and, uh, and revenue was still not high enough per car. We also chose to, to, <coughs> sorry, to close Germany. Um, and while I fully believe that Germany has a lot to offer, uh, it was also clear as a brand new market, uh, it would be a market where we would invest a lot uh, during 23. So uh, it's also an obvious market of, of preserving cash. We spent uh, since uh, the beginning of January um, moving our fleet um, and those two markets are now completely shut down. Uh, they have been for, for a while. Um, all the cars have been relocated for our other markets where they are now all operational, uh, which means we've moved cars into uh, our higher performing markets with, with higher revenue and thus uh, lower cash burn. All of this, of course, has a, a very clear, uh, both sort of short term for this year, but also longer term, that uh, we expect to bring the company close to a break even level at the end of the year, uh, 23. And also heading into 24 uh, with expectation of group profit based on, on the existing business that we have today. Um, of course, uh, maintaining what we do in the sense of, of running a green business, that's the core of what we do, um, meaning that we still only use electric vehicles. We kind of continue to do that. Uh, and I think that's, that's only increasingly supported from the cities and countries that we operate as well. 
And to, to reiterate as well, uh, the actions that we've taken um, and, and the consolidation of our market also has the consequence that uh, we have no expectation of raising new equity during uh, 23 or essentially after as well. Next, um, I think possibly a, 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 an obvious bridge as well, um, the green part of our business. Um, alongside our, our annual report today, we also published our uh, ESG and sustainability report, um, something that uh, is a, a fundamental part of green mobility as well, it's something that we are very proud of, of uh, reporting on as well. Um, I'm not going to go into details here. You, um, of course, encourage you to to have a look through it, read it. Um, this year, we've expanded also to uh, reporting on scope three, uh, which was a goal for uh, for green mobility last year. Um, so, uh, so we've we've done that this for this year as well. And, and overall, of course, a, 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 I would say a positive development on um, on all our EST parameters. Um, the next part um, before going into our our markets and, and sort of covering those, um, I wanted to as well uh, give a little overview of the fleet that we operate today. Um, I mentioned it briefly in, uh, in the highlights, but um, this is um, a, a key part of how we develop green mobility as well. For those of you who know us, hopefully all, um, um, everyone will know that we have the Renault Zoe's that's been a core part of our fleet since the beginning. Um, it remains that. It is our bread and butter. Uh, it's a very easy car to, to ride. It's also very easy for us to operate. Uh, so we are big fans of it. Um, and uh, if you've watched uh, previous presentations, you will also know that we have uh, cargo vans. Uh, we have uh, smaller and we also have a few larger cargo vans. Um, it's a um, a sub segment where we see um, a good usage. Um, there are a lot of people who from time to time need to move larger items. So that's a, sort of a speciality line uh, we have and something that we uh, continue to build up in all our markets. Then we've added uh, our premium segment. Um, we have uh, today um, Polestars. We have some Polestars here in Copenhagen and we have uh, lately also Megans. Uh, you'll see in the photo uh, currently in Amsterdam, but also uh, a segment that we plan and expect to, to build upon in all our markets. And Anders, uh, if I might ask, you know, uh, how much can you charge the premium for that and, and the reason for customers choosing the, the, the premium segment? Is, is that for longer rides, more comfortable, uh, larger? Uh, is, is that the reason why you also need that? And is that what is getting used for? Um, so, so the premiums are for um, it's that, but it's also others. We see it usually for for larger, sorry, longer trips, not larger, longer trips, um, for business segment, um, or even we also have customers saying, "Look, uh, I'm a big fan of car sharing, but I'm ready to pay a bit more and give mm. me a, a better car." Um, so, so I think between those three, you know, that's where we see the the main usage. Um, and the, the customers who choose those kind of cars, they are also willing to pay a bit more for that. Um, obviously, they are a bit more expensive cars, so, so the price is also slightly higher. Mm. Um, but I think that you have that um, ability, you can choose between different uh, types of cars, uh, depending on the need you have. Yeah. But now the premiums are still a small part of the fleet, but, but something where we see the, that they will, uh, they will grow as well over time. And from, um, from this, uh, going uh, into our markets um, and, and sort of seeing the development uh, market by market as, as we usually do as well. For Copenhagen, um, very clear, it's also our, our oldest uh, and most mature market, um, a continued strong business um, and also one where we in the beginning of the year grew the fleet uh, a little bit more um, and beginning of 22 had uh, roughly 500 cars obviously we've we've increased that uh, here in the beginning of 23 with with cars from sweden but um but a step up uh, on average revenue per car uh, compared to 21 despite uh, even an even bigger fleet in copenhagen as well 
Um, I would have expected it maybe to go a little bit up in towards the last part of the year, but um, but there we also saw the effects of um, of consumer behavior tied to uh, to all the external factors that we're seeing at the moment. But Copenhagen is uh, our biggest market, uh, and we see continued basis for for growth here, which is also why we've. We've deployed a large number of our Swedish cars into Copenhagen. Uh, they are active already now, and, and we see good development on those as well. So, um, from Copenhagen um, to our other Danish market um, in Aarhus, and where we saw a sort of a, a record in, in Aarhus at the end of um, 21. It's it's slowed down a little bit during uh, 22. But still at a at a good level. Um, also here we increased the fleet a little bit in in the start of 22, um, and a, a continued uh, good development in Aarhus. Uh, we've also extended the fleet uh, some with with cars from Sweden. Um, it's a definitely a market where we see continued support both from customers but also from the city, um, and where we've started also to uh, to. Um, develop our zone, so we cover a larger part of, of the city of Aarhus, but also some of the suburbs, um, and, and building and also our learnings from, from Copenhagen there. So, so good uh, expectations for, for Aarhus as well going forward. Then from, uh, from Denmark into Belgium, um, and um, Belgium is, is truly a very strong market for us. Um, an impressive growth uh, in 22. Uh, of course, they were also the market uh, that was mostly affected by COVID. Uh, we had uh, long periods of, of uh, other lockdowns uh, in the cities, uh, which of course gave us some challenge. But <clears throat> very clear that um, that Belgium uh, was and is a, a strong car sharing market. Um, and uh, today our second, second best market um, We've just increased the, car, the cars in uh, in Belgium by by some of the cars from Germany. So we have a little less than 400 cars in, in Belgium today, uh, and they are covering three cities: uh, so Brussels, Antwerp, and Ghent. Brussels was also a city that we moved fully into in 22. So um, so expanding the business area. Um, our our expectations uh, continue to be high for Belgium. Uh, we see a um, a growing customer base, growing usage, um, generally long trips in, in Belgium. Um, so um, um, we expect to continue the growth um, during 23 as well. Then we have um, the Netherlands. Netherlands was a, a new market for us, um, but a market that we had we've been Fallen closely, I think I can safely say for for some years. Um, it is uh, in many ways a, a very cash and friendly city. Uh, it's a city where all developments um, are heading into the removal of private and polluting cars. So um, you can't be sure to have parking if you have a private car in in, um, in Amsterdam, but the city will support, of course, sustainable cars, electric cars, but also car sharing services. Um, and we've seen uh, a past in the, in the city where it's been very good uptake, uh, which is also why we chose to acquire a company there. Uh, Fetch Mobility that we acquired had been uh, profitable pre-COVID, um, and then, like many others, been, been impacted negatively during COVID. Um, but we saw a lot of synergies between them and Green Mobility in the sense of how we operate, the, the, sort of the cost structure we have and all that. So it was a relatively easy migration um, and uh, since we took over the company in the beginning of 22 we did a full migration of customers into our platform and uh, which we concluded in end of may uh, and then in june we um, took out the old fleet and put in a completely new fleet of cars um, and by end of year uh, we had a fleet of, of roughly 150 cars in in Amsterdam, and we've just increased that uh, with some of our cars from from Germany as well. So, um, so a, um, a a strong market, but also where we have uh, high expectations for in, in 23 that we can we can grow the market and work our way back to the profitable levels level that uh, that the business in Amsterdam was at uh, pre-COVID. 
Um, last but, uh, but not least, of course, we have uh, our most northern market in Finland. And, um, and here, of course, you can see um, a lot of jumps in, in the average revenue. Um, and there are two main reasons for that. Uh, one is that we have, um, on several occasions, we've increased the fleet, which obviously uh, impacts average, average revenue per car. So in, um, in the summer of 21, we increased uh, the fleet from the original 25 into 61. Uh, that impacted the sort of second half of 21. And then again, we did more or less the same last year in uh, June, uh, June, July. We increased, uh, we actually, we took out the 61 cars that was uh, an older model and then put in 150 new cars. So roughly two and a half times uh, in size. Um, and of course, that has an impact on um, on revenue, average revenue per car. Uh, overall revenue has grown. Um, the details are in the annual report as well, but a, a good uh, overall uh, growth in revenue in Finland. But of course, when we when we increase the fleet that much, it has an impact on average revenue. Um, we do see a good uh, development in Finland, um, but uh, I think the, the second comment that uh, the, there's always tied to Finland is that it's also our most weather dependent uh, city. Um, they do have uh, stronger winters than we have in other markets. So so usually we always see an impact uh, during the winter month. But, um, but it's clear that the fleet we have in Finland now uh, is, is something that will uh, support us. We can also, and we have uh, also in, uh, increased the, the operational side there um and added additional hotspots so we now cover a larger part of, of helsinki and, uh, and the surrounding areas as well uh, including the airport in in helsinki so um strong expectations for for finland as well as if i might stop you a little bit there i think the yes. questions around the uh, revenue per car uh, as you mentioned you have started moving in and i don't know whether you want to give the details but uh, the first feeling on how, how those cars are, are getting absorbed you know you're moving into existing market how do they get absorbed do they follow your thinking that it can be absorbed in those markets and then of course there is uh, whether you could give some indication on which development you you expect for uh, revenue per car in, in the different markets in, in 23? Where will it level out? Will it rise? Uh, especially thinking that you will put in a lot of uh, more cars to be absorbed in those markets. So first, your first experience since you started moving in, and then maybe your expectation to development in, in 23 in the different markets. Um, sure. Uh, the, the, so as I mentioned, all the cars have been moved. Um, but there is also a big difference country by country on, on how you uh, import cars, um, mm. which can seem um, strange. But uh, I can safely say that Denmark is the most easy, easiest country to do it. Um, so uh, very quickly, we had all the cars uh, operational here in, in, in Denmark. And we actually see a good uptake in, uh, in, um, in revenue per car on those here already. Uh, so that's, uh, that's showing a good promise. Um, for Belgium and Netherlands, which uh, we so we didn't move any cars to Finland, we've, we've stayed with the fleet size we had to put in this summer. So only Denmark, Belgium, and Finland uh, have received new cars. Um, Belgium and, and Netherlands, uh, we also see good uptake, but it's it has been a slower process, in, especially in Netherlands, of um, of getting uh, new light, uh, new um, registration plates on, on the cars. Um, so the administra administration uh, offices simply work slower there, um, but uh, all our expectations are, um, are good, um, and, and because of course we base it on what we've seen already. Um, also, uh, competition in terms of fleet sizes um, and market size in general. So um, I expect that we will um, over the coming months we will see that um, in both those countries and. The new uh, cars will uh, will take up revenue and, and reach the same revenue level uh, as we've um, as we've seen in the past. Um, no doubt that that uh, Q1 will be lower when we look at these graphs because uh, when when you insert a large number of cars uh, that um, uh, they they have to be absorbed. But 
going forward during 23, I fully expect that they will they will take up the same revenue level and continue to grow as well. Uh, and I think that's that's also a key part that um, coming from um, levels of, of five, six, seven thousand per car, uh, it's it's very clear that in in terms of reaching a, um, a break even level by end of year and also going into 24 uh, with a uh, profitable business, then we need to bring this revenue up because otherwise uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a challenge. Um, but that's but the, the, the Netherlands and 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 uh, and, and uh, the Belgian market in Denmark, uh, I guess you you put a lot of cars in in already high revenue uh, markets, you know. Uh, so what are your expectations there? Are you fighting to keep those levels, uh, or do you expect them to to go a little bit down, or are you willing to to go as far as and say it can be absorbed, and maybe even we can raise the the level of uh, in in the two Danish markets? Uh, in Denmark, I fully expect them to be absorbed as well, no doubt. Okay. I expect that we can continue our growth uh, per car as well. Um, as mentioned, um, I, I would expect that. Q1, of course, will be yeah, will yeah. Q1, tell so. that there's, a, there's an impact, of course. But going from there, uh, we should get back to the same level as we are at the moment. And from there, growing uh, the, the average revenue as well. No doubt. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, just we, we as sort of uh, wrapping off on, uh, on our markets before uh, we look ahead. Uh, we, we recently conducted a, um, a customer survey. Uh, you'll also find some information on it in our annual report. Um, but uh, of course, it, it's, it's always a, um, something that makes, makes us, us proud that we have a very high level of customer satisfaction uh, because that ties directly into how we grow the business as well. It is based on, on satisfied customers who are, um, who are willing to recommend us as well. Uh, for us, that's, that's key. Um, I just learned yesterday as well that we are now ranking number one on uh, on mobility apps in Denmark, uh, which uh, is a a great um, uh, accomplishment from from our tech and marketing team as well that we've we've moved to that and we've we've got that uh, acknowledgement. Uh, and I think one of the, the maybe just the last comment on our uh, customer usage here is that that we see an increase in. Um, the willingness to do something more uh, f- to have a sustainable ride. So, seventy percent of our customers are willing to walk a bit further to get an electric car over a traditional car. I think that that shows something about where we are as a market and and what people uh, all the focus that and the consciousness that our customers have about the the choice they make for for mobility. Then, obviously, uh, looking ahead, um, something that is um, always um, super critical, super well, super interesting, super critical, um, and and also something uh, on our guidance we announced earlier today. And I think we can sort of break it down in, in two, which we also did in the beginning of January, that that we have uh, a very clear uh, short-term uh, target, um, of course driven by our, our guidance for 23, but also the fact saying we don't expect to raise new equity. We expect to come close to a break even level by end of year and go into 24 uh, as a profitable year for green mobility based on, on the business that we have today. That's a very um, clear um, and, and updated focus on our strategy. Uh, we want to bring the company into a profitable level uh, and then continue to grow the business from there. On a longer term, um, obviously, we, our, our ambitions are unchanged. We, uh, we're still very determined on being a leader in, in sustainable and shared mobility in Europe. Um, it will take longer, no doubt about that. Um, of course, very much tied to, to, the, to the challenges that we've seen externally and, and things that are, that are essentially out of our control. Um, we will continue to, uh, to work towards our long-term goal, but I think on short term, the key focus is that we want to bring this from a loss-making into a, a profitable company, and we have that as a basis uh, of, of building um, growth and expanding to, to, new, uh, to new markets and new cities. Um, so for next year, um, 
based on on the markets that we have now, and then of course there's, that's uh, clear. It's it's uh, it's those four countries we're in um, that we will uh, we expect to grow our revenue by 40 to 50 percent. So a target of 135 to 145 uh, million kroner, um, and at the same time reduce our uh, net result. Um, so. Uh, expectation of, of a net loss of uh, somewhere between 35 and 45 million by, uh, by 23. And then, um, of course, as I mentioned, um, long-term uh, aspirations, they are, they are changed. Um, there's, a, there's a very clear market, and we also see that from the cities and the countries we're in, even other markets as well, that, that the, the political focus is, I would say, more unchanged or even uh, increased. That, there, there, we need to have a change, um, and we're definitely a, a key part in, in making that change. Um, then maybe just as um, as the last part in, in, in the area of going forward, um, as uh, some of you uh, probably know, um, we changed a little bit in our uh, executive management in November. Uh, Thomas, who's been our CEO for, uh, for quite a while, he, um, he left the company. I've had the pleasure of, of also being interim CEO for, for a period of time. But um, uh, as of the beginning of, of March, Casper uh, uh, gives I and I can see that his name hasn't been changed. That's very embarrassing. So I'll jump by here. That is not going to look good at the next no, meeting. No. No. <laughs> I have to give a big apology to, to Casper. But, um, but but, no, but but you have you have a management change, you know. Before yes. we go to the, the to the questions, you I know. think that's uh, that's very. I, key. I, I, if I look at, at, at your new CEO's uh, CV, it's clear that it's a high experience with managing large uh, car car parks. You know, as, as as a rental, I know it's a different business model. But have you put anything into your twenty three where you are looking more as how can we use our uh, car fleet? How do we get a better resale value? Where can we lease it cheaper? I, I guess that's also something that the new CEO will, will will bring to the table. So, so have you put anything into the expectations of uh, being able to better life cycle manage or, or operate your fleet uh, in, in that connection? Well, I, I well the obvious question would be yes. Uh, the yeah. answer, of course, yes. Um, Casper is, uh, as you mentioned, um, a very experienced uh, guy. He's worked as CEO in several companies, um, uh, both in the rental industry, previously in six and uh, in his budget, and, and has a lot of, of experience and knowledge on, on fleet uh, handling, buying, selling, uh, financing, of course. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's one part. But, uh, and, and then lately as well, four years experience on, on building platforms. So those two ties very they tie very well together in, in the business that we operate. We are of course based on a platform. We do operate a fleet, um, and and I think and uh, we we will also see um, some some new input and new ways of thinking in terms of how can we continue to build revenue in the fleet. And I think that's yeah. equally important. Um, that that we have. I think we have. We have many more areas where we can develop the business uh, on revenue-wise. Uh, obviously, you can always find uh, improvement in operation as well. Uh, that goes for, for any company. But but thinking in different ways in terms of, of revenue will be a key part as well. And then uh, let's go to the question. Uh, you saw a larger growth in customers than in trips. What is behind that uh, development? Is a lot of customer coming in in the end, or is it uh, the customers that's actually as you said, uh, as you mentioned in, in the start, uh, has changed a little bit your pattern. So uh, customer growth, uh, uh, trips growth can't really follow customers growth because customers are, uh, you know, uh, taking less trips. So so to a little bit about the comments and maybe what can you do about it? Uh, can you more push now you have the customers in? Can you start targeting those better and try and get the, the trips up again? Uh, well, I think there are, there are several elements. Of course, we continue to grow our customer base. That's that's obvious. It's, we need customers to, to build the business. Um, one part, of course, is also that that we've, um, as we acquired a company in, in the Netherlands, we also acquired a customer base there. So, mm -hmm. so there's there's uh, some of it is also a jump uh, tied to uh, to fetch mobility. Ah, okay. Um, <clears throat> but I think uh, you. 
the way of, of looking at it is also that we continue to uh, bring in new customers, but of course there was a, a slowdown in terms of, of trip and usage uh, towards the end of the year. So, so that's that's another part of it. Um, but and they don't necessarily always follow each other. Uh, that would be the logic, of course. But um, but uh, of course, all new customers need to to go out and, and ride uh, not only once but. Uh, several times uh, that's always a clear ambition and uh, the, the next question do you still target to be profitable in 2024 and i think you uh, commented that on the strategy slide that that's still your target then uh, yeah. how are falling energy prices affecting you in in in, in 23 are you running on long contracts uh, or do you need to wait to the spot prices feeds in so so more how 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 has how has you put that in your guidance you might say on, on the cost side do you expect the energy prices to to go down a, a little bit and secondly do you actually need to match that by also removing the energy surplus you are you are charging by customers yeah um so uh, first of all the the um the energy cost of course it differs from country to country and and Denmark is the only one where we still see a high charging cost. Uh, it's a um, uh, it's a little bit ironic because when you see the spot market, it's way way lower. Um, we've also had customers uh, contacting us and and asking why. But reality is that charging costs are still high. Um, and if you go to any public charging uh, polls, you will see that as well. Um, we are of course pushing uh, our suppliers. We work with most of the charging operators in Denmark. And we are we are constantly pushing them uh, because we can see the same figures as uh, as everyone else. Um, they do expect it to drop. Um, I would expect sometime during Q2. Um, I don't know what it will drop to, but it has to come obviously closer to the spot market. I think everyone can can agree with that. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, so that's that's definitely something we're pushing for. Um, once we see. Um, that it changes, we will of course also remove our um, our energy surplus. We've actually mm. just removed it in all other markets than Denmark because we've in in so Belgium, Netherlands, and Finland we've seen a decrease in charging costs now. So we've removed the fee actually this week, um, and and it's a natural, very natural step. And and trust me, we want to get rid of that fee. It's it's not very easy to use, and and I would much prefer not to have it. But uh, but when you have a Hundred percent increase in, in in net costs. Then obviously we have to do something, um, but it's it's something we follow very closely. Um, and uh, uh, of course we've also looked at it from I think in terms of guidance we looked at it of course conservatively. Um, I can hope and expect that that this will drop, uh, but I think the challenge is we don't know what it will drop to. I'm, I'm, mm. Personally, I'm sure. So, more, well, what have you put in your your guidance? I think you mentioned on one of the first sites that you took the current condition and put them into to, to, sure. to guidance. That's, I think what we know today is what we have to assume for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, at some. And some then there's a potential upside if if they if they will start going down. Yeah, but you can also there's also a discussion will interest rate continue to go up. So it's, you have pluses and minuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think. When, when we do expectations, we have to be on the conservative side, of course. But um, I think uh, if everything is as we know today, uh, I think it, we can safely expect that that charging costs will go down because electricity cost has gone down already. Um, it's it's more a matter of time. And, and then actually looking at the other side, the, the consumer confidence side, or, or your your customers. You know, you were a little bit dark. Yeah, now dark is the wrong word, but you you went more pessimistic in in in, in the end of the, the last year. And and I think if you look now right now, it, it hasn't paid it hasn't panned out that dark. I, I might say. I also think I start to see some you know consumer confidence rise in in the countries you are in. So you are feeling of that and maybe a little bit what you have seen in the start of uh, 23 on, 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 on the trip side, you know. So if you can elaborate a little bit about that without giving you <laughs> if you one away, that's yeah. one. Uh, whether you were, And maybe what have you put in your guidance? Is it still a, 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 you're still a little bit worried about the, the consumer side of, of, of the business with the second part of your business, the, the, the customer? Well, I think... Uh, 
if, if last year taught us anything, it is to be a little bit nervous. Um, yeah. And in this sense, I would say more nervous on of the unknown. I mean, um, and, and of course, still the trigger effect is, is what happens to the East. Um, will that, will they find a, a peace or will it get worse? That has an effect on, on macro figures that, that we can't control. Um, but aside of that, uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic um, uh, to play it safe. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right from, from maybe a, um, in the last part of, of 22, uh, being more uh, gloom about it, more dark about it, then yes, uh, I think we've seen some, some more positive development. It's, it's slowly coming back. Um, I see people that, uh, going out to dinner here in Copenhagen, in Belgium, in Netherlands. I visited our markets uh, a few weeks ago and um, people are traveling at the airport, people going out to dinner. All these things are positive triggers as well for, for consumer behavior. Uh, and obviously they need to move either to the airport or in a restaurant. So, so that has an effect on, on our business as well. Um, so so overall, I think, I think we can be uh, cautiously optimistic going uh, A little, go little bit less gloomy. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's put it that too. Okay, perfect. Can you comment on the life cycle of your Renaissance? You know, are they living up to your expectation? And and maybe in my head, I also said that uh, you know we've seen the some of the EVs uh, fall in price because of Tesla. You know, and you have a large fleet. Are you away from that segment? So you are not attached to that. Uh, I know by your new cars, but uh, but but by your older cars, could that also push down the prices? So talk a little bit about the life cycles of your renaissance whether they are living up to expectation i don't know whether the question you here wants to know three years and, and 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 those things and in my head also one of the questions i had was is there something happening to your fleet's value by the the lowering of price of teslas are you too far away with the renaissance to not be attached to that um so so i think there are multiple answers here but but let me see if i can <laughs> catch all of them um, for one, when we look at the life cycle of, of the Zoe, it lives up to our expectations. I would even go as far as saying it has exceeded our expectations. Um, over the, the years, I think we've sold upwards of a thousand cars. Um, so we've also been able to sort of prove um, and, and um, sort of get some certainty around that the book value we have and the, the models which appreciate it according to that they are actually true to market as well, which they have been. Um, so, um, uh, and of course, it's also important to say when we when we resell a Zoe, it's not end of life. It, it, it still has life. We don't, uh, usually a car that's four years old, maybe if it's done 80,000 kilometers or even less. So there's still a lot of, of kilometers left. We still see a battery um, of a very good percentage. So, so we have customers for, for, for these cars and, and we could definitely resell them. Of course, they are worn, they, they are used, but, um, but overall, we are we're actually quite happy with the fleet. Uh, we will um, change some cars in the fleet as well. Uh, we don't expect to increase the fleet, but, but we have some that have, have reached their maturity, uh, meaning that they are four years or older, we, and then we, we swap them. Um, so overall, we are, I would say, very happy with the Zoe. It's, it's very... Uh, it's a nice and simple car. It works, and um, and we have buyers for them as well. Um, in terms of the the, the Tesla action, um, yeah, I think there are various reasons why they did what they did, um, <clears throat> but we don't see uh, any negative impact on our fleet. Um, so to answer your question directly, we don't see a risk in, on our balance sheet. We uh, we we test our. Um, our book value uh, on a regular basis uh, versus the market. Um, and, and we actually test also against a lower price um, in the sense that when we resell cars, we don't sell them one by one to private individuals. We sell them as fleet, uh, fleets and then usually they go out of the country. So, so we work with, uh, with different price levels. Um, and then I think as well, so one of the things, I mean, we've also seen a uh, an increase, uh, even though Tesla has lowered that, most other EVs have also increased in prices in the last year, year and a half due to supply chain issues and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that also helps the, the resale value of the cars. And then there's uh, the last question. Let's take that. 
Copenhagen has a high revenue per car. What are numbers behind this? You know, number of trips per day, duration, uh, the, how long the trips are. Uh, can you try and compare that to the other cities? Because I guess the learnings there is what you would like to to move to the other cities. I know there's time, there's life uh, time uh, differences also. But why are re uh, Copenhagen uh, higher revenue per car? Is it simply, you know, I think uh, the the hard way to ask it is that is that the size of the city that is perfect you know the, and it's it's harder to get to other places or you know digging a little in between the numbers why this is a higher revenue compared to other cities maybe maybe help us to understand whether you can uh, you know uh, repeat that in other cities yeah um one clear factor of course is time um, that at Copenhagen, we, we've been active in Copenhagen since uh, 2016, and some of our other markets are, are, are more recent for us. Uh, so there's there's an element of matureness, uh, maturing uh, the, of the market. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, size of the city is is a factor as well. Um, but I think we can uh, we can to a large extent sort of compare Copenhagen to Brussels, Antwerp, and, and Amsterdam. They are not identical, I know, but but mm -hmm. they are all larger cities, um, <clears throat> which which also means that that we can compare a lot of figures for those cities. Of course, factoring in um, the size of the fleet, um, how long have we been active, and so on, and how long has car sharing been active and. And that's also why we have uh, very high expectations for, for both Belgium and for uh, for Amsterdam or Netherlands as well, uh, because we see those market trends. We see some comparable figures um, overall in terms of when we look at number of trips, um, duration, usability, usage, and so on. Uh, but there are also differences. Um, what we see, for example, is that in, in Belgium, they have much longer average trips than, than we do in Denmark. Um, and when looking at it from a sort of a higher perspective, okay, Copenhagen, similar to, to Antwerp, um, <laughs> hopefully I'm not offending anyone, but, <laughs> no, but, no. Um, but, but there is a, there is a different, uh, what we see is a different work life, uh, um, patterns in Belgium. So people will go longer to work or, or from, um, or how they work. Whereas maybe Copenhagen, again, very generally, but you see a lot of people coming into Copenhagen every day. Uh, so, so we see different patterns, um, and of course, that's that's a key part of our business as well. That that we have these KPIs that we constantly measure. We we, we push, of course. Uh, I mean, when we look at trips per day, um, we have to always increase that. That's, that's very simple. But we also have to to factor in um, what are the differences of the city, uh, and that's why revenue per car ends up being the best um, comparison mm. because. We can have less trips in in, uh, in Antwerp, but still a high revenue. Um, so, and at the end of the day, the, the revenue is the key part. Um, that's 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 why we we make the the company profitable at, at the end. So, I think that the hard the hard uh, the hard question would be: so it's not competitive side, you know, because then then you are not able, you know, to 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 reach uh, the same pro, uh, same uh, mileage. So it's. The competitive side, uh, you, you you don't think has any explanation in uh, in, in in the differences. Uh, if you understand that you have harder competition in the other cities. No, I, I, no, I, think I would uh, I would even maybe to some extent argue the the opposite that that uh, on, at least until you have a oversaturated city, which we don't see anywhere in, in our markets, then then having more car sharing and the notion of car sharing generally actually yeah. uh, builds the market. So, so to, at the moment for us, it's it's more a matter of building the market, getting the knowledge out, um, uh, promoting uh, towards uh, more customers, building more revenue into the cars. Um, and we see that growing month by month. Perfect. I think that was the last question. Thank you to you, Anas. Thank you to the, to the audience for, for the questions. May everybody have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael.